Good morning everyone and let me give you a very warm welcome to our service this morning. We're delighted that you've been able to join us here at Seagate Church in Trim today for our online service, even although we are still in the grip of lockdown and we can't meet in our church building. Wouldn't it be great if that were possible and we were walking through our church doors this morning to be welcomed into our Sunday service and we would all come together to worship our God. Well, this week that prospect became a little closer with the slight easing of lockdown restrictions, but I think we all know that congregational worship in church is still some way off. But I hope you still have that sense of excitement and expectation when you come together this morning. Uh, perhaps that same sense of excitement about meeting together today as the psalmist had when he wrote these well-known words of Psalm 122 eh, many years ago, even if today we are meeting as a virtual gathering in the church. Remember, here is how David captured the excitement of going to church. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That's where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. So today we come together as the people of God to worship him. And we do have another full programme, if not a packed church, to be excited about. Of course, this is Mother's Day, isn't it? And we will be giving thanks for our mums during the service today. And we hope also to get a glimpse of some of the newborn babies that have become part of the Seagate family recently. Uh, we will also hear again from one of our missionary partners today, and we hopefully will be able to view some of our youngsters' amazing Bible-based artwork. Uh, and I just want to say to you guys, well done for all the drawings and the colouring in that you give us each week to enjoy. It's brilliant. Uh, keep going. And also today we'll be continuing our studies in the Acts of the Apostles when Matt Pierce, who is one of our elders here at Seagate, will bring us God's message later in our programme. And of course we come to worship and we are so thankful for those who lead us in praise and those who bring God's word as they read it to us. And today we our thanks to Jane Stewart for bringing our Bible reading later in the programme. So, as we gather together, let's give God the glory, just as God's people did all those centuries ago when they rejoiced as they gathered in the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for yet another opportunity to approach your throne, to enter your home, to come before you with our prayers and with our worship. And Lord, we come to offer our thanks, our thanks for your greatness, for your love, for your mercy, for your patience with us, Lord, and for your grace, and for all the blessings that you shower in us from day to day. Lord, we thank you for the protection that you have given us in this time of pandemic. And Heavenly Father, our hearts are truly filled with thankfulness this morning for your goodness to us and for our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has made it possible to come into your presence and to bring our praise and our worship to you. And so, Lord, we ask that you will bless us as we are gathered here today, that our praise and our worship might be acceptable to you and that our hearts may be ready to receive what you have prepared for us this morning. So now, Lord... We enter your gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. We enter your courts with our praises as we come in and through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning. Before we continue with the service, let's take a few moments to come before the Lord in prayer and dedicate the rest of the service to him. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for another opportunity to meet with you together, albeit separately, by the use of technology. Lord, we thank you for all the equipment and the people capable of using it to bring us together like this each Sunday morning. And we pray that you will touch everyone watching this service this morning, whether they be in Troon, South Ayrshire, spread across Scotland, the United Kingdom, or indeed around the world. Lord, we think particularly of mums today on Mothering Sunday, and we ask for a special blessing on them. We pray that it will be a day of blessing, of peace, of relaxation and rejuvenation for them. We think particularly of mums that have been homeschooling their children whilst also struggling to work from home as well. What a challenging time it has been. And I pray that for those that have got primary school age children and now the homeschooling has come to an end with them going back to school tomorrow, I just pray that today will really be that period of rest following all that hard work. Lord, we lift up those mums that and, and dads and grandparents that are still facing homeschooling with secondary age children. And just pray for more strength from you, Lord, to enable them to continue in that task. Lord, we also think of the the mums from that attended mainly music. And I thank you that we've been able to go out and deliver gifts to those that have been attending the sessions in between the lockdowns. And I just pray that those gifts will have gone some way to helping them know that they are loved and appreciated by Seagate Church. I pray, Lord, for a real blessing on them today. And we pray that it won't be long before we can restart the sessions in the building. And we look forward to welcoming new mums, especially those that have had babies during lockdown. We think particularly of those mums that have had their first babies during lockdown and not been able to have the support of other mums and the toddler groups and as much visit uh, visiting time from health visitors, midwives, family, friends. Just be with them today, Lord. And Lord, we also think of those that have perhaps lost their mums recently, either through COVID or other issues. And we think about those mums that perhaps have lost their children, either before they were born or since. And we acknowledge that today, can be a very challenging and hard day for people in those situations. Lord, we bring them before you now. And we ask that you will just be so present with them, that they will feel your loving arms around them, Lord. May they know that you love them and support them. And may you be an ever-present comfort to them, Lord, particularly today. And Lord, we bring the rest of the service to you. And we pray that whatever it is you want to speak into the hearts of each person listening, that that will be received. We lift up Matt to you as he brings your word to us later on. And we pray that every word that he speaks will be from you, Lord. May they not be his words, but those words which you want to speak through him to teach each one of us. So, Lord, may we humble ourselves now. May we come before you and open our hearts open our ears and our eyes to see and hear and receive what it is that you want to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my life
It's, it's good to see you, everybody. Uh, I'm here um, this morning with uh, Mark Hind um, from Open Doors. Uh, Mark, it's great to have you with, with us this morning here in our Seagate service. Um, Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and uh, just introduce yourself to the church. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, my name is Mark Hind. And so currently, I'm the team leader for Open Doors here in Scotland. And uh, I formerly, uh, from a teaching background, uh, then uh, God called me out of that into pastoral ministry, led a church for a few years. Um, and then about three or four years ago, uh, God just moved us from uh, where we were, quite remarkable, a couple of um, real answers to prayer, uh, made it very clear he wanted us to take on this role. And, uh, and so here we are, we're based in Lark Hall, although we're about to open an office in Cumbernauld uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, really exciting, but um, but yeah, I, I can't think of anything um, that you know I'd be more privileged to do than representing the first year church. Fantastic! It's uh, and it's great to have you uh, here with us now. For those uh, who are watching this morning, um, many of them will know what Open Doors uh, does and and what it's all about. But uh, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, tell us what 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 is Open Doors? What what do they do? So Open Doors is a ministry. Uh, we exist to help people follow Jesus uh, no matter the cost in places where it really does cost the most. Um, so we work in 60 or 70 countries where Christians are persecuted. That word literally means they're pursued for their faith. So that could mean that they're discriminated against, they lose their job or their income or they're kicked out of their homes or their families. And in extreme cases, it can mean that people are imprisoned or killed for their faith. And what we do is we come into these countries not to go and be the church for them, but our ministry really is to come alongside to support them 
to strengthen them, cheer them on, encourage them to ask what resources we can put in their hands so that they can not only survive, but really thrive and share the gospel and shine the light of Jesus. And then we also ask them, how can we pray for you? And we bring those prayer requests back to churches like Seagate Evangelical. We really encourage the church here in Scotland to pray, to support, to get alongside. So it really is a ministry. We just carry strength from one part of the body to another. Hopefully we do a bit of that this morning. Excellent. Uh, yeah. And of course, I mean, things here have not uh, have not been easy, but for many, of course, of your uh, partners and so on, uh, life um, has been extra specially difficult uh, over the last year because COVID is a, is a global um, phenomenon. It's uh, something that affects every country in, in the world. H- how has that then been affecting the work and, and how have uh, the churches been uh coping um, with persecution on the one hand and, and, and this COVID pandemic on the other? Yeah, it's really interesting, Richard, actually, because you, you, you might think that in, in COVID, persecution might ease a little bit as communities pull together, but actually the opposite's happened. We've found that it's been the cover for a lot of increased persecution. So some of it's been on the level, um, you know, that Christians obviously can't work. They often earn a wage in many of the countries on the world watch list. And, uh, and in, in this lockdown, they've not been able to work. Uh, and so where there's been government aid, community providing food, Christians have kind of lined up for their portion, their uh, rations, and they've been told, you, you can't have. Uh, so part of our work's really been, you know, kind of stepping up what we have rapid response teams that kind of move in and just try and, you know, support the church in that way. Uh, we've, we've found that, you know, people, um, you know, cases of Christian nurses being sent into ICU without any PPE, whereas they, the, the other nurses would have, just because they're seen as dispensable. And the incredible challenges, you know, increased, um, you know, activities in sub-Saharan Africa, things like that. And so as a ministry, our, our work's had to really increase and, and step up. And yeah, I, you know, so there's been a lot of challenges, but actually on the other side of that, amidst the increased challenges, places like India really is, is Christians are really suffering. Uh, there we found this incredible thing of the church still growing. Uh, and, and it's often the kind of tension of the persecuted church, you know, that the Christians really suffer. So they have to kind of lean into God and press in a little bit more. And, you know, as God says, in our weakness, he, his, his strength, his power is, is perfected. It works better. And, you know, we've, we've seen some incredible things. Just one encouragement from Sri Lanka, our, our team there, uh, tell us that there was a little community church and uh, this church has been under, you know, real attack for a few years. Uh, about a year ago, some of the believers were on their way to church and they were pelted with missiles, a mob formed and they were hospitalised. It was quite distressing for a small community church. Uh, and then fast forward a few months to COVID and lockdown and the pastor sent to the local Open Doors partner and asked for some rations and some food, uh, not just for his church members, but for the whole village. And similar to what your church has been doing in this season, they went round and they knocked on every door in the village. They handed food parcels and rations. And you wouldn't believe the power of the gospel and the impact that that's had. And many people have come to faith in Christ. And the thing that blessed me most about that, uh, that report was that seven of the young people who were in the mob that day felt in those missiles are now attending the daily prayer meeting. You know, so just this thing about God's grace in the midst of trouble and, and, and you know, kind of, Two things, you know, if we were to remove the church from the context of persecution, we'd be removing the gospel, the power of the gospel from these dark places. So we come alongside, as I said, but an encouragement just for anyone watching this morning, that it's in these moments of trial and trouble and difficulty, like the season we're in now, that yes, we have to lean into God, but that's when God comes through and does the most extraordinary things. And he doesn't promise to remove us from trouble or to take pain away from us, but he does promise to walk through it with us. You know, and so uh, this question somebody asked me the other day is, is the truth you've come to believe worth a lifetime of struggle? And our persecuted family, even in this season, would say, yes, Jesus is worth it. Absolutely. Uh, Mark, you, you won't have known, of course, that um, as a church we are, uh, I'm, I'm we and I am preaching through Acts. Um, and indeed, that it just all that you've just said just resonates with what we read in Acts of the church, um, certainly from Acts 8 
onwards as it's scattered in that persecution and they just keep speaking the gospel, gossiping the gospel. And, uh, and, and we as a church have just been learning that through this year of difficulty ourselves. And it's, it's really encouraging um, just to hear about the church in other places that God is still moving and is still active through his people in these in these places. So and so so encouraging. Um, Mark, I, I'm going to pray for you if that's if that's okay. And uh, then we're going to watch a, a little video uh, from Open Doors, just uh, talking about the watch list um, of the of the ten most difficult countries um, for. Uh, people to be Christians, just for people to stir people's hearts in prayer uh, for uh, the persecuted church. But uh, uh, let me pray for you, Mark, and uh, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, dear Father God, we, we want to thank you uh, so much for Mark. Uh, Father, we thank you for what he has just shared with us uh, this morning. Father, we thank you for how you have taken him and his family and used them uh, in, in lots of different ways, Father, and that you've brought him into this role of open doors. Uh, and Father, we thank you so much for uh, how they are connecting with local churches. Uh, Father, we think of that church in Sri Lanka. Uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to see that you're still moving. Father, that those who were helping uh, the church and seeking to do it harm, Father, are now members of that church. What an encouragement uh, that is and what a great and good God you are. Father, stir in our hearts as a church um, to be remembering uh, our persecuted brothers and sisters uh, across the world. Uh, and may, Father, you continue to work through your church for your glory. Amen. 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 Mark, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, hopefully uh, when this is over, we'll get you down uh, and you can come down in person, down and see us here entering NC Gate. Thank you. Uh, God bless. I love that. Thank you, Richard. God bless you all. See you
dissolve like snow the sun forbid to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing Acts 25, verse 23. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Festus ordered that Paul be brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are here, this is a man whose death is demanded by all the Jews, both here and in Jerusalem. But in my opinion, he has done nothing deserving death. However, since he has appealed his case to the emperor, I have decided to send him to Rome. But what shall I write the emperor? For there is no clear charge against him. So I have brought him before all of you, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that after we examine him, I might have something to write. For it makes no sense to send a prisoner to the emperor without specifying the charges against him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you may speak in your defence. So Paul, gesturing with his hand, started his defence. I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one heeding my defence today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders, for I know you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now please listen to me patiently. As the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If they would admit it, they know that I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of our religion. Now I am on trial because of my hope in the fulfilment of God's promise made to our ancestors. In fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day, and they share the same hope I have. Yet, Your Majesty, they accuse me for having this hope, why does it seem incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorised by the leading priests, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison, and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priests. About noon, Your Majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes, so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so, King Agrippa, I have obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have been changed by the good things they do. 
Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this and they tried to kill me. But God has protected me right up to this present time so I can testify to everyone, from the least to the greatest. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead and in this way announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. But Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is a sober truth. And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I am sure the, these events are all familiar to him, for they were not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul replied, Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. Then the king, the governor, Bernice and all the others stood and left. As they went out, they talked it over and agreed. This man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Welcome to our online service and thank you for joining us on YouTube from wherever you might be. Um, today is Mother's Day and uh, I'm afraid mums and grands, um, it's your second lockdown Mother's Day. Uh, this time last year, we weren't quite legally into the full lockdown, but we were making moves towards that and restaurants were being cancelled, and it wasn't quite the Mother's Day that you were uh, planning and hoping for. Um, we didn't know what to expect. At least this year, we've had a little bit of planning uh, to plan for an unusual Mother's Day, so I hope you're gonna be able to make the most of it. I'm just gonna abuse uh, the privilege of being here in front of you, knowing that my mum is watching this service as she does every Sunday from down in Lancashire. So, hello, mum. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. And uh, also to my mum-in-law, she'll be watching from up the top end of Troon. And uh, hello, Peggy, happy Mother's Day. I love you too. Thank you for letting me have that indulgence. Um, let us pray. Lord, we've become, come before you and we ask you to soften our hearts and let us be able to hear what you have to teach us this morning from your word. Please give us wisdom and guidance as we need. We come to you with reverence and gratitude for your word as it feeds us. To your name be all the glory, in Jesus' name, amen. So what's going on in this part of Acts? As I studied this part of Acts, let me tell you, it's been an exciting journey for me, and I hope you can join in with me in that excitement. Um, it's been a build up in the past few weeks from Alistair, Mark, Gareth and Richard bringing us through um, the story of Acts and Paul's journey. And it doesn't stop here. Um, indeed, Richard will uh, continue the journey for the next two weeks as Paul makes his way to Rome. Acts is such a wonderful book and following on for the, from the Gospels, teaching us about the Holy Spirit and then showing us these amazing examples uh, of Paul's life and examples of how we can apply that to our lives today. Today's sermon is titled The Trial Part Two and last week's sermon was uh, Richard delivered Trial Part One. So that made me think I've got to follow an ex-lawyer talking about a trial. Might be difficult. Um, so as I studied this passage, um, I've been in the season of homeschooling and uh, where I've been a primary school teacher's apprentice. Um, now I've been particularly bad at that, um, so much so that uh, they've actually sacked me and the, the teachers are calling the children back tomorrow to be at school properly. Anyway, it made me think about the way that I'd actually been studying at this part of Acts. And as Mark says, all sermons have three uh, points or three sections. And today we're gonna to have a history lesson, followed by a literacy lesson, and then a numeracy lesson. And I hope I'm gonna do better at this than I do at uh, primary school teaching. But seriously, this isn't a primary school session. And I hope you'll be really encouraged by Paul's examples as we look at his story in these three lessons. So the history lesson, let's look at Paul's experiences from this passage and all about his story so far in these past few weeks. 
So just in case you haven't joined us um, on our CK uh, YouTube sessions, or as a reminder, um, because we've been talking about it for a few weeks now, um, let me uh, tell you a, a recap. So Paul has been off around various areas of what we would call uh, in modern times, Turkey and Greece. He's been teaching at the churches and evangelizing. He comes back to the region around Caesarea and Jerusalem, and he's arrested and he's in the garrison prison in Caesarea. He's accused of causing riots amongst the Jews all over the place. And they say he's a ringleader of the cult known as the Nazarenes. A mob in Jerusalem are so fired up that they want to kill Paul. Paul points out that he's a Roman citizen by birth. And he's brought before the local governor, Felix, to have his case heard. Felix doesn't think there's a case against Paul though. But he can't release him in fear of losing his public favour. So he procrastinates and just leaves Paul in prison. Two years later, Festus comes and uh, takes over from Felix. And um, this brings us up to the point that Richard took us to do last week. Um, and in between um, that last week and the start of the uh, passage that we're going to study today, um, Festus went up to Caesarea to he hear what Paul had to say. And um, he suggests that Paul could come down to Jerusalem to have his case heard there. And Festus was thinking the mob um, might kill Paul on the way and the problem could be dealt with. However, Paul asks, uh, as a Roman citizen, to have his case heard by uh, the Emperor Augustus Caesar in Rome. And then King Agrippa comes to visit Festus. And this is where we start our story today. So at the later stages of uh, Acts 25, Festus um, introduces Paul to King Agrippa. And he says that this man whose death is demanded by all the Jews where they are in Caesarea in Jerusalem, um, Festus tells Agrippa that he can't give a clear charge against Paul and he's stuck because now he needs to send him to the Emperor Augustus Caesar. But he's got no clear charge against him. So we move on to Acts 26 and... Uh, Paul is in front of King Agrippa and Paul starts off his defense. And again, as earlier in the chapters that we've heard this before, he begins by saying that he started off life just like these Jews that accuse him. He knows their point of view. He was one of them in his youth. In fact, he was a Pharisee, a really strict part, a sect of the Jews. In verses four and five, Paul says, as the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If they would admit it, they know that I've been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of our religion. And then he says he was even against Jesus. In verses nine and 10, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus of Nazarene. Indeed, I did that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priests, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. And I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Paul is saying, I was one of you. In fact, I was worse. I was a strict Pharisee. And I even caused the death of people that followed Jesus. I completely understand you. But then Paul continues his defense and says he was converted in his belief by Jesus himself. He explained he was on a mission to do this kind of work he had always done, persecuting those who believe in Jesus. And then, as he went along that road to Damascus, we know this story really well. The risen Jesus appears to Paul. And just at that stage, he was still called Saul of Tarsus. A bright light shone down on him and his companions. And Paul continues to explain, in verses 14 to 18, we all fell down and I heard a voice in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord, I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to, to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me. Tell them what I will show you in the future and I will rescue you, both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, 
Then they will receive forgiveness of their sin and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. This is Paul saying that he was given a God-given mission to spread the news of Jesus. When he was the last person you would expect to do that. But in response to this defense, Festus then declares that Paul is simply mad. In verse 24, suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. But then Paul appeals to King Agrippa. And in verses 26 and 27, and King Agrippa knows about these things. Paul's talking. I speak boldly, for I am sure these events are all familiar to him, for they were not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Now, King Agrippa was in a difficult position now. He has Jewish heritage. He could agree with Paul, but lose his credibility with Festus. He can't deny the prophets in front of the Jews. Paul is appealing to Agrippa, saying he's familiar with these things and they weren't done in a corner because Agrippa was around and would have known what's been happening with Jesus and the early Christian movement. Festus might not have done so because he's recently arrived from Rome, so maybe he's got an excuse. But in response to uh, Paul asking King Agrippa in verse 28, Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become as Christian so quickly? It's amazing that Paul in this dire situation, but he's still evangelizing and trying to bring Agrippa and the rest of the people at this hearing to know the Lord Jesus. But they must have been believing Paul because the passage today ends with verses 30 to 32. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left. As they went out, they talked it over and agreed. This man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. So Paul has to go to Rome. And Richard will tell us about that really amazing story next week and the week after. Um, but Paul is happy to go to Rome and have his case heard by the emperor uh, because he was told to by the Lord. We just need to nip back um, a couple of chapters in Acts. When Gareth was preaching to us um, a couple of weeks ago, he said that Paul had been put in the garrison. And um, if we go back to chapter 23, verse 11, um, it says, that night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, be encouraged, Paul, just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. So this part should end to be continued. Please join us next week for Paul's journey to Rome. Um, Richard will do that. Let me continue to our next lesson about this passage though, the literacy lesson. So don't worry, it's not an academic uh, language or literacy uh, study. Um, not only could I maybe uh, not do that very well, but we have a few language teachers in the Seagate family who might spot my flaws. Uh, but this section, it's uh, seeing the points that that history story tells us. Um, and firstly, I need to tell you something about my job. Um, or more specifically, the training for my job. And um, Lee says it's uh, the same thing for pilots. Air traffic controllers and pilots, we're really quite a simple lot. Um, but we need to know a few technical things just to make it so that we can do our job well. And at one stage, I had to do a bit of work into the technicality of the way that we training train controllers. So basically, we tell them something technical, then we tell them again in a different way, and then we maybe ask them about it and check their understanding of what we've told them. But then we tell them what we've been telling them all along and then tell them again. And so if something is really important, um, you get the gist that we just tell them different ways of, uh, in multiple uh, different times. And in my primary school uh, uh, teacher apprenticeship, even though I've just been sacked for poor performance, um, I got the gist that's what we were trying to do there. Anyway, why tell you all that? Well, have you noticed, as we take Paul's journey through Acts in the past few weeks, and in particular um, the past three weeks when uh, Mark spoke to us about chapter 22 and then Gareth took us through chapter 23, Richard had 20, chapter 24 last week, and today it's the latter part of uh, 25 and into 26. Um, but Luke, who is the author of uh, Acts, repeats the same things about Paul. 
The story of Paul's amazing conversion has come up twice in the past few weeks, even though it was fully explained in chapter 9. He's not going to waste words by repeating aspects that aren't really important. Luke is a physician. He's written a gospel and then followed it up with acts. He's clearly a clever man. So if things are repeated in the Bible, we really should take notice. The three key points that are repeated several times are Paul's example of his past. Um, he's just like the Jews here who are accusing him, or actually he was even more against Jesus. Then secondly, his conversion. And the third repeater point is his subsequent evangelizing and suffering. No wonder we find the past few weeks we're saying the same kind of things. But what can we learn from that? Paul's past is probably much worse than the average person that you are going to meet, even if you went to do some speaking in a prison. Um, so Paul shows us the example that we shouldn't judge and think someone wouldn't listen to us or can't be changed and forgiven or that they are too far off to hear what we have to say. Yes, we can't do that in our own strength, but we don't need to. It isn't ours to judge other people. So we don't have an excuse really, not to want everyone to come to salvation and know Jesus. The Damascus story, uh, the Damascus Road story is repeated. Paul was brought to Christ in a very dramatic way. And from a place of being completely against Jesus. If Jesus was able to do that with Paul or Saul as he was then, he can surely work wonders in our lives and save lost people that are on our hearts. We'll not do it in our own strength, but with prayer we can ask for the lost to be saved. It might not be the same dramatic experience as Paul has had, but then Paul was being converted to an apostle and be among those that had seen the risen Jesus. But being saved will transform people's lives. If you'd like some further encouragement today, can I, I really recommend uh, if you would go back in Acts and read chapter nine. Um, if you read verses one to 31, it's hard not to just read that and get enthusiastic as you read it. The third repeat of points uh, through these passages is Paul's evangelism and suffering. And I'm not saying that we all have to be amazing teachers and go touring southeastern Europe and the Mediterranean region and then go into trial and go into prison and next week it gets even worse for Paul. But it shows that in our relatively minor suffering in comfortable Scotland, we can take Paul's example and glorify the Lord in any suffering that we face. Paul took every opportunity in his hearing with Felix, with Festus, with Agrippa, and next week we'll find how he does it faced with calamity and he takes an amazing opportunity in Rome. So we've heard that story and the examples of Paul throughout this passage, uh, but just let me knit back into the passage because there's a, a bit here um, that just shows the character of Paul and also connects us to the next part of um, this lesson. So verse 20, um, Paul says, I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have been changed by the good things they do. The New King James Version puts it like this, but declared first to those in Damascus and Jerusalem throughout all the region of Judea and then to Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. This bit, they have been changed by the good things they do or works befitting repentance. That is just showing a willingness to live a, like, a Christ-like life as much as possible and showing that we don't earn salvation by doing those good works. Salvation is freely given to us by God's grace. But having had that salvation, we should so want to live a Christ-like life that we do those things pleasing to God and befitting our repentance. One of those things is being fruitful. Let me just take you, um, talk about being fruitful and befitting our repentance. Um, there's a couple of passages from uh, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. Matthew 3, 8, 
Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Luke 3, 8. Prove by the way that you, have, that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Other translations, instead of saying prove by the way that you live, they say bear fruit by your repentance. Now, a safety message here. I'm preaching to myself here too. And don't think for one minute that I'm successful at this. Um, yes, there are some people in our Seagate family that are better than others, but don't sit back and expect them to take on all the work. We all need to respond. The main point is that we need to be uncomfortable by this challenge and not rest back and just lean back and just say, oh, well, I'm saved. Being fruitful, this takes me to the next lesson, the numeracy lesson. And you may wonder where we're going here, um, but we're making a conscious point of praying for the lost in the local community on uh, Wednesday lunch times at the moment. The church gathers together at 12.30 to 1.30 on Zoom, and you're really welcome to join us. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, but by doing that, we're praying to be fruitful and multiplying, uh, hence the numeracy lesson point. Um, staying on the theme of these calculations, in one of our prayer times on one of these Wednesdays, I remember praying about the R number and praying for the lost. In our current pandemic situation, we've all learned what the R number means, the reinfection rate. We want it low. We're told how to block the reinfection. Um, remember that diagram that the Scottish government put out in an advertisement and it starts off with one person and it spreads out, that person reinfects a number of people and then it spreads out like a diamond shape and when you get over to the right hand side there's loads of people infected starting off by this one person. But we were taught to put blockers in the way. Person two worked from home and that blocks the next few people expanding out. Person 10 didn't go and visit the mum, so they were blocked. Person 11 stayed a two meter distance and all that reduced the total number infected on this side of the chart. The total number on the right was less because the reinfection was blocked. But we want the Lord's salvation R number to go up. He wants us to be infectious with our faith and tell others and not to keep it to ourselves. We don't want blockers in the way. We want opportunities to spread the news about Jesus and then it will pass on that message to more. The people on the right, we want to have as many as possible starting out with ourselves. But we're not gonna do it on our own and we don't want to just rely on a few people. It could be those opportunities, could be Jeanette spoke to a person about the book of James on the ballast bank. Judy invited the teachers at Troon Primary School to a Seagate event. Richard told the man in Lido how Jesus had changed his life and we're getting that infection rate going up. But let us not rest on those people to do the work. If each and every one of us is brave enough to take those opportunities and share our faith in our own unique circumstances, we'll get the Christian message R number high. And talking of R numbers, it reminds me of Mark's four R's that he spoke about uh, about three weeks ago. Um, when we're talking to people about our faith, remember what he said, the four R's, be relevant, be respectful, be real, and be ready. As I bring us to a close, um, can I refer to a Bible passage that we were learning in jam time a couple of weeks ago? Um, that's another bit of homeschooling that uh, we've been doing. And jam time leaders, whenever you're happy to take our children back for the jam time sessions, that'll be great. I'm sure they'll appreciate you more than, uh, more than the parents. Uh, anyway, we were studying Mark 8, 34 to 38. Then calling, this is Jesus speaking, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, 
The Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's all, me included, take every opportunity and not be ashamed of Jesus. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, we'd love to share our faith with you. And if you've been listening uh, today, you'll have heard my challenge to the Seagate family. So you should be able to go and speak to any of them about this. And if you aren't local, my words aren't unique. All Christians know this command to them. And I've been asking them to be brave, to go and share this good news. So go and ask them. And we normally give you a nice invite at this stage, don't we? By saying, uh, come and speak to us. But actually, I'm going to give you a challenge this week. Um, if you want to know more, please do something about it. Please ask someone. Be brave for yourself. If you don't know anybody that you can speak to at all, please contact us. We'd really love to hear from you. And you'll see at the banner at the end of the service, our email address. Please contact us. So if you know the Lord Jesus or not, you've got a challenge today. But please don't do nothing. Let me pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus and we thank you for the example of Paul. May we learn from all these and be fruitful for your kingdom. To your mighty name be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
So we've been talking about sharing the good news about Jesus. And now we come to the part of the service where we share together in uh, remembering that Jesus came to save us from our sins and allow us to have eternal life. We remember his death on the cross where he suffered for our sin. And then we celebrate his victorious resurrection. Um, so if you believe and trust in the Lord Jesus, I invite you to join us in communion now, wherever you are in your homes, as we take communion simultaneously. In Corinthians, uh, we read, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to God for it, and then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Thank you uh, to all of you for tuning in this morning. And mothers and grandmothers especially, I hope you have a really wonderful day. And thank you to all the people that pull this service together, the people that you've seen and heard, but also those people that you haven't seen. There's people working behind the scenes. These flowers don't get there by accident. Uh, there's lots of work done, and I thank you to Phil for recording this session and editing all this service. It really does take a, a, quite a chunk of time to do that, and we really appreciate it, so thank you. And because we've been studying Paul's example to us, I thought we should end our service with a blessing that Paul himself gave. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at verse 11, Paul says, Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow to maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. All of God's people here send you their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Goodbye.